very nutritious vegetable. It's very high in vitamin C, it's high in folic acid, and it's high in vitamin A, actually, and it's a good source of fiber. But many times you have more okra during growing season than you need, and so you want to preserve some for later. In Oklahoma, the primary eating method for okra is fried. And there are other methods that work very well as well, but many people object to okra because it's mucilaginous texture. That's a fancy word, and if you talk to any kid, what they'll say is it's slimy, it's gummy, it's sticky, or it's slippery. So let's look at some ways to preserve it and to cut back on some of those texture problems. First of all, looking at fresh okra, this is fr fresh and washed. You'll notice that it comes in a variety of sizes, and you've probably seen it much longer than this. The bigger it gets, the more fibrous it's going to be to the point where it gets woody. Now, as you prepare it for cooking and or freezing, you want to match similar sizes up so that those are less than three inches you put in one pile, those that are three inches or longer you put into another so that you can blanch them equal lengths of time. Now, the next step as far as freezing is concerned is to cut the, trim the stems off. Keep the, the cap intact because if you cut into that cap, you're going to let all that slimy t stuff or the, the juices come out and that's going to affect the blanching water and you don't want to have to work through that as you're blanching. That you can work through later. So just trim off the caps. Don't trim down far enough that you cut into a seed pod. Notice here you can see that the seeds are beginning to be available or visible and if that happens then you know you're going to have slime coming out later on during blanching and you want to avoid that. When all the caps are trimmed, again remember you've sorted them into equal size, Blanching is very important for freezing because if you don't blanch, you're going to have a lot of enzyme activity and bacterial activity that will continue during the freezing time. Those won't be stopped in freezing, they'll just be slowed down. Blanching for short pods, three inches or less, is three minutes. For longer pods, it's going to be four, in, or four minutes. Now you put them in a blanching container and simply dip those into boiling water, timing them from the time you put them in shake them up a little bit. These are a little bit longer. Four minutes will be good on those. Once they're blanched, you submerge them in ice water for the same length of time you blanch them because you want the cooking period to stop as soon as you're done. If you don't stop it then, it continues to over blanch and that can be as harmful or more harmful than not blanching at all. Now this is the time when you can cut the pot. Now if you're going to freeze them for uh, a gumbo or for another use, uh, you can freeze them just like this. Once they're blanched, put them into a freezer bag like this. Make sure you get as much air out as you can, and you're done. Stick them in the freezer so they freeze as, as quickly as possible. If you want to freeze them for frying, however, you have a couple of more steps. First of all, you're going to want to cut them into similar length pieces. Whatever size you would normally use for frying is where you'd go with these. Put them in a container here, and then what I have here is a two different ways to do this. Now, it depends on how you like things frozen, but you simply put them in with some flour, for the first method, close the bag, shake it a little bit to coat them, take them out, put them onto a cookie sheet so that they dry, and, and those are done. Uh, they're ready to, to go into the freezer. On the cookie sheet, you spread them out thinly, let them freeze until solid, then package them into a freezer container later on. The second method for freezing is a little bit, uh, got a couple of more steps. First of all, we're going to take a little bit of milk, and we're going to have equal amounts of pancake mix and cornmeal. Stir those together a little bit so that they're well blended. And this will give you more of the, the feel that most of the okra I see in Oklahoma uh, has as far as frying. It's got a little bit more to it than just uh, a flour coating. These are dipped in the milk very briefly and then dredged in the meal so that you get them coated. Now the milk helps hold the coating on so that you get a little bit more uh, chance that everything's going to stay on in the freezer. One of the biggest problems with doing this, one of the, that most people have, is that the coating falls off. Now freeze these again on a cookie sheet individually and then when they're frozen good and solid, then you can bring out a freezer container. Now for this I'd use a solid container because it's going to have less damage than a plastic bag. They're frozen solid, set them in here, and then as you layer them up, set layers of wax paper over them so that you don't, again, da damage them, bump them. Now the biggest trick to doing this is cooking them from the frozen state. If you let them thaw, there's going to be moisture condensed between the okra and the coating, and that's going to release the coating during the frying. So bring your fat up to 375 and cook them directly from frozen, and I think you'll have fairly good success. You can do the same kind of procedure with uh, fried squash, 
Uh, same steps, check for blanching times on those. Those may be a little bit different, but the same process as far as coating, freezing, and cooking directly from frozen. That'll all be the same. Hope you enjoy this this winter. Until next time, this is Barbara Brown.